Welcome everyone watching in line, watching online tonight. Uh, I'm Brendan. I'm Arts and Culture Manager at the London Irish Centre, and I've been given the absolute pleasure and honour of hosting this Q and A with David Keenan tonight. But it's the great people at Dock and Roll Festival who have brought us together tonight. So just to fill you in a little bit about Dock and Roll Festival. Dock and Roll Festival started in 2013 as uh, the UK's music documentary film festival. This year, though, it's taken the form as a hybrid festival. Uh, so Dock and Roll ran up until yesterday, the 15th of November, uh, but have decided to extend the online screenings of David's concert film, Alchemy and Prose, until this Sunday, November 22nd. I've seen it myself. Um, it's fantastic. It's absolutely fantastic. So if you haven't watched it yet, please make your way over to dockandrollfestival.com after we finish up here tonight and watch it. It's brilliant. So. I'm going to introduce David. David, how are you keeping? Good, Brendan. Yeah, it's good to see you, man. Yeah, good Thanks to see good you. To see um, so, David, Alchemy and Prose, like I've watched it, I've watched it a lot of times now, but uh, I have to say it blew me away. Probably, you know, like it, it reminds me of like the distant memory of, of gigs now at this stage. But um, just for anyone out there who hasn't seen it yet, uh, can you just tell them in your own words what's it, what, what it's about and what they expect to see? Well, look, I suppose it's it's three years of my life condensed into one hour and, six, and 17 minutes, I think it is. Um, and it just maps my story from moving to Dublin and trying to get some sort of kick up, some sort of dust, trying to find people, like minded souls that I could find acceptance around and, and, and that I could create something with. And it goes through all the all the, you know, the those monumental early gigs and Whelan's and the Grand Social and you just see this kind of community that's forming around this thing and then it cultivates or cultivates and culminates in the Olympia in January just gone with the release of my first record and obviously the headline gig of the Olympia which which was a dream you know to, to play there and something that I speak about kind of early on in the film about trying to make this thing happen and, and trying to make this set happen with all these all these bodies um, fighting for the one cause, if you like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, a, it's a real treat now for anyone who, who, who goes over and watches it. But uh, I just want to remind people that uh, tonight, it's not just going to be me who's asking the questions to David. Uh, feel free to, to write your own comments in, maybe it's say where you're tuning in from. It'd be great if anyone who was at the gig in the Olympia could maybe comment in and just let us know that they were there. Uh, in the great days of live performances and um, if, if you have a chance as well please share the stream on your own uh, on your own pages um, yeah so it's, I have to say like the thing the main thing I took away from the film it, well not the main thing one of the one of the uh, one of the themes that I kind of dug out and it's probably kind of like it's probably personal for me and everyone will get their own theme from it but uh, it was the the theme of fear and overcoming fear, uh, not overcoming fear, as you say in, in, in the in the film, using fear as, as a motivation. And uh, I just wanted to ask, you know, is that is that something that kind of drives you throughout all of your music? And is it sign of something that you've come to terms with recently? Or, you know, how do you use fear to, to drive yourself? Well, fear, I think, permeates nearly, you know, Every, mis every decision that we make in life on some level and for me I always I always try to look at it like you know to take my insecurities and my and my my low self-esteem and to try to turn them into something that would drive me so in other words fear would make me brave you know that kind of way um, and and in, over the course of the film you know I, I try to kind of meet it head on because that's what music gives to me that's what writing gives to me Writing allows me to understand what's going on inside me and around me, and it's a way of venting, you know, alchemy and prose, you know, the alchemy is taking the pain uh, and taking the, the shadow and, and taking the, just taking the trauma and you, you're, you're turning it into something beautiful and, and hopefully healing in the process. Um, now fear has always been there. I mean, it's, it's kind of a juxtaposition for someone to stand in front of a crowd of people uh, and and be full of anxiety but like I said I, I, I don't know what it was I just always had to get into the ring you know and it's mm. like a box it's like a boxer you just have to get into the ring to prove some point to yourself to prove some work to yourself 
but the fear and all those kind of motivations are matched with desire and ambition and and and, and a love of of doing it it's not all just uh, getting out bile you know it's about documenting the beauty in life and I always wanted to be part of a tribe. I always wanted to feel connected to a group of people because I think there is a great strength in numbers and that comes across in the film. Yeah. This, tribe, this tribe of two generations of Irish musicians who come together and, you know, it's, it's, it's egality, it's, it's, it's togetherness. Um, all these things, you know, are, are very easy to turn into cliche, but fuck it, you know, it's like, it's there, it's evident, you know what I mean? Mm. You wouldn't know, like, I mean, to see you performing on stage, you know, you wouldn't think there's any fear there, you know, you seem fearless. But once you break through that initial kind of two minutes before you're, before you're going to walk, how am I going to do this? And yeah, something else happens, you know what I mean? You, you, you transcend fear, you transcend fear. And that's what, that's what music and, and that's what live gigs do to people. You forget the outside world, it's just the world that's happening in the venue. And we're really yeah. missing that now. We're missing the live medicine that music gives us, these gigs give us. Like, if you look at the film and you see that, I mean, that's essential because the power that's created at gatherings like that and, and the intimacy that's created. So we're living in a time where we're, we're being denied that. And that's why I think the film is like, it's just, an, it's just an, a reminder of how important that live music is and how it should be nurtured and how it needs to be protected. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like... I mean, yeah, to to have been at that gig now would have been an amazing, amazing treat. Like, you know, we've got we've got people just to let you know, we've got people tuning in from Liverpool, Denmark and Castlebar. Um, so that's we're going, we're going live to the world. <laughs> I mean, yeah, so that, that that gig and that, you know, that that energy and you, you talked a little bit about the um, the tribe that you built up around you. I mean, let's 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 talk about the tribe. I mean, to look at to see the film, there's so many kind of heavy hitters in there. You know, so many so many great names: uh, Junior Brother, Ronan O'Snodig, um, you know, Gavin Glass. And tell me a little bit about the tribe. And and I know I noticed kind of in the film there's there's the unholy ghosts, um, which is kind of your your so much your kind of mentors. And then there's another kind of tribe you have. Um, and just, you know, tell me a little bit about, about these people that, did you kind of like organically pick up this, this, this tribe along the way, um, since 2017 and, uh, you know, how did that build? Well, you know, there was a great desire to meet people, uh, you know, like everybody you just mentioned and. But I think I was open to kind of finding them. And once I was open to finding them, organically, I started meeting them. Do you know what I mean? Um, mm. I mean, for me, like, it's been a real lesson in letting people into your life. And because uh, I was very kind of reserved and kind of shut off from the world for a long time and slowly starting to let people in. And obviously them letting me in as well. Uh, but, you know, looking at the film, there's the Unholy Ghosts and there's the Organics. And although yeah. there's, a, there's a different generation there, I was being educated by, by both groups of people. Do you know what I mean? Because we're all going through these things together. Like we're all, we were all in the trenches together, you know, playing the gigs to two, you know, a man and his dog and, and then slowly seeing the audiences get bigger over time and, and just sharing in life. There's a real intimacy in playing music with people that is just, it's hard. Like it's, it's hard to explain that bond. Um, yeah. But I, d- I definitely owe them a lot, and I'm very grateful that I met all of them, and pr- just proud. I'm proud of that group of people because it's 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 a testament to you know the good heads and and, and the positive heads that that are out there, and and um, it's beautiful to be part of something bigger than yourself. Do you know what I mean? And and that's what I felt, and that's what I feel when I'm with those people. Obviously, we've um we've just had a great loss to the group uh, in losing a brother and a friend, Gar Kane. Um, it was in, in the Unholy Ghost and he was the MD of the band. And, um, you know, these restrictions that are being forced upon people, they're having a serious psychological impact and an emotional impact on everybody. And I don't think that's been discussed enough, you know, and I don't mm. think the, co- the correlation is being made between artists who can't get out and deliver their art in a, in a, in a face-to-face way 
it's having severe it's a severe trauma and I think it needs to be spoken about more you know and and yeah you know it needs to be nurtured we need to we need to pick up the dialogue act you know what, what's going to be done you know to, to protect how are we going to rebuild in the future what's being done it's great doing zoom calls don't get me wrong you're, you're a decent you're a decent man Brendan. <laughs> But face to face is what we need, and we need to we need to we need to uh, retain that hope that nights like the Olympia are coming, and we're going to make them come very fast. Yeah, there's no substitute, no substitute for that connection, and that connection that you had, obviously, with you know, and you still have with yeah. with your tribe as well. Um, do you manage to kind of stay well connected? Obviously, I'm, I'm sure you mentioned you know Gar's passing, and has that has that rekindle a connection between you and the other members uh in, in recent days yeah i mean gar gar's passing has given a new life to, to the group of people because we all i think we all realize collectively how special those few years years were for us and, and those those adventures that we went on and you know kind of prophetically Gar said to me in the Olympia because we didn't know how things were going to go if the band was going to tour and what was going to happen with the record and Gar said you know he said Dahi if, if this is my last gig I've made my mark and and how, how true that was you know and, and he did in every which way um, yeah. but not only, not only is the film about us it's also about the audience you know like obviously there's a lot of footage from the actual Olympia gig mm. in Alcatraz Frozen you know, I find I find it incredibly moving when you see people in the audience holding each other's hands, you know, yeah. singing together, venting together. Because, like I said, this is an arena for people to go and to let everything fall off, let the let just shed everything on a gig. And that's, you know. yeah, that's what that's what I found watching it. Actually, is just like the 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 connection to the audience was such a huge part of it. And uh, we've got a good few comments of people coming in here now. So it's, uh, Claire says, hello, David, congrats. I was at the Olympia in Whelan's. Very proud to have watched the Spirit Store days uh, to the Olympia. Best wishes from Dundalk. Um, we've also got uh, Marion. Uh, it was always going to be one of the gigs of the year, but I never thought it was going to be one of the only gigs of the year. So lucky to have been here. It was happening. <laughs> and... Uh, Oh, so, so many amazing comments. And uh, I was there in the Olympia and it was a, an amazing night. I've been following David for many years uh, and to see him on the big stage and with the big names around him, it's always amazing. That's in from Cormac. So yeah, that's that's what I kind of noticed when 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 watching um, when watching the film is just that connection to the crowd. And uh, it, it seems seemed almost like a, like a bit of a therapy, like you were kind of breaking down walls for people and breaking down you know, telling people to hold hands and, and, and stuff. And is that a, is that a big, you know, that, that obviously is a ma ma major part for you then, is it? Well, I just see the, the kind of the age old link with musical gatherings and, and expressing with, with healing. But, you know, like it's not, it's not about that. It's, I'm not claiming that at all. People come and they do it themselves. You can try to invoke a sense of, you know, there's no, there's no hierarchy here at this gig. Although I may be up on a stage, it doesn't mean anything. There is no gig without the audience, you know, like in a way. And a lot of people in the Olympia would have, you know, been with me and, and the band and for three or four years. And, you know, because it was word of mouth, I'm not a big streaming artist, uh, you mm. know. In the early days, it was word of mouth and it's still to a certain extent that as well. So the Olympia was almost like we did this together. You know what I mean? We made it here together and thank you. And thanks for the trust, like I say and the film thank you for the trust you know um yeah it bookends that chapter and i just feel very privileged that i was involved in it you know everything that happened around all the car journeys all the plotting to make this film happen obviously with the collective as well and meeting them mm. um the music videos that we've made together and the growth that happened and so i mean i'm i'm blessed um i'm blessed to be sitting here talking about a film about three years of my life you know i really am that's brilliant. And and about um, collective films, like uh, I noticed, you know, they did they've d done a couple of your recent uh, music videos and stuff as well. Um, so when did you when did you first meet Collective Films team and like how, did, how when when was the seed planted to um, to start this documentary? I think it was late 2018, early 2019 that I met um, Ken from the Collective. Um, and then, and then a couple of months later, I met Mark, Mark Logan, the director of the film. Um, 
yeah, and the first conversation that we had, I said, look, my, I'm sorry I was late. I've, I've got a pain in my gut, you know. He said to me, um, you're repressing something, you know. There's something, you're repressing something there. You're stressed about something. And that was a level straight away of dialogue between us. So I said, look, listen, there's more to be explored here. Um, I just trusted the gut. And uh, I said, look, we're making the record in the Hellfire Club on Monday. You're welcome. The door's open if you want to come up and, and meet the band and document some of it. Because um, it just felt right. It felt like a relationship to pursue, you know. So yeah, I think I think they all they felt the same way about myself. And um, I mean, they're, in, they're an inspiring group of people. That's the thing. When you're around people that kind of compel you to be the best version of yourself, you carry that into situations, you know, like, uh, that's what was that's what's special about the tribe as well. It's like, like you mentioned a few of them before. They're also yeah. incredible. They're just they're just great people in their own way. Everybody and, and and in that environment, you can't help but kind of go okay, step up and feel part of this brilliant thing. So yeah, one one person that actually stands out to me as well is uh, is Harry. Um, you know, Harry, <laughs> Harry Harry kind of like seems to stand out as a character and and someone who really took you under his wing at the start, I suppose, you know, in, in a in a protective way. So, yeah, tell me a bit about Harry. Well, I first met Harry in, in Chine in 2015. And <coughs> it was a songwriter night and I put my name down first on the list because I had to get the last bus to Dundalk home. So I had to get out early. But I remember looking up and Harry was on a bit of a height and he was laughing at me, you know, and I was like, you know, I, I had a chip on my shoulder as an angry young man from Dundalk, and I was like, I'm going to say something to this guy, you know, what's he laughing at me for, you know? <laughs> but he was only laughing because he he just heard a couple of my songs, he was like, you you know, is that your song, blah, blah, blah. So we just Im immediately hit it off, and it just flowed, and, and you know, I was wary of Harry's kind of like, he, he wanted to just give me advice, and there was no hidden agenda. Um, mm. But like I said, you know, I'd never... I, I was kind of my my own, I'd isolate myself from everybody and I was on my own mission, one man mission uh, against whatever it was, I'm not sure, but eventually we just became incredible friends and, you know, a lot of what happens in the film, we kind of, we, 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 we spoke it into existence. I know that people might, may not be believers in that, but I think it's important to visualize what you want to achieve in life and conversations with Harry at four in the morning, we, you know, you got to work with this guy. Maybe try this. Mm. Harry's been a great friend and a mentor, and he's, he's he's one of the greatest songwriters that I've ever met. You know, that's that's something you know, a lot of people know about him. He's an amazing songwriter as well. Yeah, yeah. I noticed, like, I mean, something that kind of struck me as well watching the film is that um, someone someone with more of an ego or someone with more of a um, a bit of fear, I suppose, would would be afraid to get on stage with all these big names, you know, um, with, with with all these like great musicians, you know, would 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 be afraid that the limelight would be taken away from them. But I suppose it's just, it kind of seems to be what you're all about is just the, you know, the community, the collective, I suppose. Um, I just think that's an amazing thing, like you know, just being being able to. Uh, being able to stand on a stage like that with other people and and just enjoy it for what it is. Well, I think <clears throat> some people are are facilitators. Some people are, are out there, you know, you know, like Garrett's a, a composer, and, and and everybody is a different personality <clears throat> in the group. I think maybe mm -hmm. that one of my one of my strengths was bringing people together, you know, and, and putting people in, in in the same space and and trusting the intuition and seeing the magic that happens. But like. I, 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 I kind of from very early on I was like this is a craft for me and if I want to get better as a songwriter I want to surround myself with people who have you know have great experience and, and not only that but are, are, are kind of are, de are decent heads and, and I feel comfortable around because like you know we, we're all can be shy and sensitive in our own way and, but um, you know I've just I've, I've learned so much from all those people and like I said it's a lesson in letting people into your life and the song is just a passport if I write a song here that song would lead to maybe me playing that song with a group of people and us going on a trip. And the song is the passport for all these things to happen. Music is the passport for all these relationships to happen. So, you know, that, yeah, I, I felt grateful from early on. To, although, like, Gavin would give me advice and I'd, I'd rage against Gavin's advice because he was, you know, he was 
he was older. I saw him as a kind of father figure, and I was like, "Don't tell me what to be doing." But that's <laughs> an, yeah, that's an angry young man. You, you know, such re- relationships of that nature have have these moments, and that's important as well. You have yeah, to be man. able to have it out with people. You know, Th- that's all part and, of it. Yeah, that's all part of it. Um, another thing that kind of stuck out to me is uh, of a theme is uh, I suppose it's something you mentioned a few times in the film is your move your move to Dublin being a big kind of part of it I suppose, but um, you're telling me you, you've lived in a couple of other places as well and I, I remember reading that you lived in Liverpool for a while, um, and you said you said you visited London. What's what's your take on on why Dublin is so special to you, can compared to other other cities. I just think, I mean, as a kid, you know, reading about all the kind of beautiful bowsies from Dublin and being and all, Anthony Cronin and, and Flann O'Brien, mm. I just had a romanticism about it. And, you know, my uncle would take me up to Dublin as a kid and, you know, just walking the streets, you could nearly see all these ghosts of people, you know what I mean? And, but then obviously, you know, the place and the experience is defined by the people that I met, you know what I mean? Mm. And uh, Rob Benson was a big part, a photographer whose archive footage is in the film. He was a huge part of me moving to Dublin. A room came up in the house and he said, look, he insisted, you know, this would be great for you, man. And again, like if I had said no, or if he hadn't have insisted, would I have moved to Dublin? You know, mm. uh, I needed to, I needed to, I needed to leave um, my hometown because you know, I just needed to leave. No disrespect to my hometown. You know, I just needed to get out for myself. I needed to explore. I, I, I needed to get out of my own way, you know, that kind of way. So mm. moving to Dublin, moving to Dublin was massive. And then obviously Liverpool for me was being close to the lads and, and you know, the, it's just those great songwriters like Michael Head and Lee Mabbers and, um, you know, I met some great people there as well, gigging in the Lomax and, and, all these, all these, you know, late night bars, and it was a great experience for a young, for a young fella. You know what I mean? Trying to find himself, and uh, and in terms of musicianship, sitting at the feet of all these guys like Jimmy and the Revolvers and stuff, you just pick. I was like a sponge. You know? Yeah. London was London was, um, you know, back and forth to London for a few years was was a different. I was more isolated there. I didn't have that kind of community, but mm. sometimes it's what you make of it, you know. But a lot of the time, I think it's who you you kind of fall into you know, true you, yeah there's, there's lots of people asking us here now um uh asking you to come to different places different cities um when when the restrictions get eased uh where's where's the first place you'd love to love to visit um for a gig when it's safe <clears throat> well obviously coming back home you know to, to ireland just being in ireland there's there's um just the subtleties that you miss of home, you know, you miss, you miss mm. the crack, you miss, you miss the diddlement, you miss the, you miss, you just miss your family and friends. Um, we had a great time in New York, myself and the tribe last October. It was amazing. Um, and I'd love to go back there in some, in some way. Uh, but look, we're living day to day. Do you know what That's I mean? Nice. It's, it's brought it back down there. Mm. I kind of I get excited when I'm when I'm getting onto the plane, you know, because you just, it's, important, it's important that we just keep it in the day. We, you know, with social media, we're being bombarded with so many different things at a million miles an hour, and because we're going through this collective trauma, I think it's important for us as individuals just to try to look after ourselves, look after our energy, and not be, you know, it's important to keep one eye on planting those seeds for what's coming down the line, but just yeah keep it in the day so we'll see but i can't wait to get back on the road when 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 i am allowed that of course yeah yeah as, as do we all but um so i got a comment in here from barry who says uh hey david uh how are you it was a great pleasure to have met you back in Li- in liverpool at the lomax so that's from barry, <laughs> oh, barry. yeah barry sutton is it no uh, i'm not sure actually but it's it's uh it's a barry <laughs> so um Eddie comments in, so a sellout at Wembley, is that the dream? Is that dream getting closer? Remember our deal. Yeah, I, remember, I know that I know that man, I remember him saying that to me a few times, you know, but I mean, it's like, it'd be great and all that, you know, but it's not something that uh, I think about, you know what I mean? It's, I think no. about, like, no, you know, you have ambitions and for me, it's just about writing, 
writing a decent song, you know, and writing a decent song and being able to bring the song out on the road and mm. it's five, if it's 50 people or if it's 5,000 people or whatever, it's just important for me to, to keep a certain standard up in the songs and to try to evolve. You know, I've recorded my second album over the last few months and, uh, you know, that'll be, that'll, be out, that'll be out next year. So this film is, is book, this film encapsulates a time and this next record will be the start of a, of a new phase, you know, but I'm always writing and it just keeps me well. When I'm kind of in a good relationship with the work, I seem to be in a good relationship with, with the world. You know. Of course, yeah, yeah, nice. So that that's kind of been that's been your plans, I suppose, over the past while is in writing. I the first the first um, uh, the first album is uh, obviously a beginner's the beginner's guide to bravery. Um, can you tell us the title of the second one? <laughs> no, not yet. <laughs> beginner's guide to bakery. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, keep all the banana bread recipes and stuff out beginner's there. Guide to <laughs> That's brilliant. Um, so, what have you been listening to during lockdown? Any kind of any standout records for you? What have I been listening to? Um, Mark Hollis, Mark Hollis, the solo record, it's amazing. Um, I've been listening to Miles Manley has a new album coming out, which is I can't wait for. Miles Manley is brilliant. I love, I love Miles. I love Miles. Yeah. Uh, what have I been listening to? Do a lot of reading. Um, Werner Herzog, you know, I get a lot of inspiration from films, and I get a lot of inspiration from painters and how they describe how they see. You know what mm. I mean? The art, the art of seeing really. Painters and how they articulate what they're seeing helps me put form to. Well, because when I write a song, I see all these images flashing in my head, and I'm trying to kind of sketch. I'm, I'm trying to paint backwards or something. I can't really explain it, but. A lot of that stuff. Um, uh, Bird, that album, Bird, B-U-R-D. I was listening to that. Jinx Lennon's new stuff. Um, oh, yeah. You mentioned Jinx Lennon as a big um, inspiration before. It's, uh, well, I suppose just being from being from Dundalk. And, um, you know. It's not, only, it's not only that. It's just the quality of his of his work. You know what I mean? He's, 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 just, he's just a fucking... He's just a truth seeker and a spewer, you know, and it's but also beautiful, like um, that beautiful folk folky record that he did a couple of albums ago. But it's hard to keep up with Jinx. He released a new album, two two albums a month or something, you know. <laughs> he's amazing. He's amazing. Mm. And tell us a bit about you know, and, um, going back to obviously you haven't been back in a while, but you know, you spoke about an experience before about playing in. Uh, in Dundalk again, years later, playing El Paso um, as as a as a tune and and kind of overcoming that, uh, you know, it being one of your first tunes and, and kind of it sitting better with you. But uh, what's the experience of of going home now and and playing those gigs? Is it, you know, it's always I assume it's always a beautiful one, yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean it's beautiful to be home and see mm. Derek in the Spirit Store. Um, you get your family get to come to the gig, obviously, because it's. It's only in the road of no excuse. <laughs> but yeah. um, I think a lot of people would agree that your hometown gig sometimes can be your hardest, you know, because a lot of people might come in and they know you over the years. And, you know, uh, it's all love and support in Dundalk. You know, I have to I have to say that. I mean, the Spirit Store has been like a... It's been like a, a ninra. You know, it's like a training ground for you as a kid to go in and play. And... Mm. Um, I love Derek. Derek Turner is just, he's a, he's a hero of mine, you know, but um, I'll only play El Paso in Dundalk. It's the only place, yeah. that, I, it's the only place that I'll play the song. Um, and that's just because of, you know, like I wrote that song when I was 15, mm. going up to Oldham Park, over at, beside the Spirit Store, drinking cans and a certain group of friends. And then it went off on its own on a bit of a tangent for a while, but, you know, you, you can't stay 15 forever in your own head. And so when you're singing a tune, I think it's important for me to believe in what I'm saying, to be able to be honest and enjoy it. And yeah. I'm just so far away from that 15 year old kid, not like shunning him. He's in here. I love him. I embraced him. In fact, the last gig that I did in the Spurs store, I wasn't going to play the tune. I think it was the year before last. And I said, look, I'm going to heal here tonight because I've been running away from this little kid with the shaved head and full of anger and 
pain and frustration and resentment. But tonight I'm going to heal them. So I'm going to sing it, but you're going to fucking help me sing it. And the, the audience all sang it. And that's healing through music. When I finally kind of surrendered to stop denying that, that's you. It's just because mm. it was, you know, music is a music is a memory trigger. Do you know what I mean? Like a yeah. smell. So I didn't play that shit because it, was, it triggered so many parts of my experience that I just, I, you know, I, I wasn't ready to look at. But yeah. And that's kind of, I suppose, it's kind of coming full circle then as well, isn't it? Like, you know, in a way. Full circle. Uh, that's great. That's great. So we got a good few comments in here from um, Sarah says, uh, Beginner's beginner's Guide to Bravery got me through this year. So I think that's that's a, that's a lovely compliment. And um, Caroline says, watching from the South UK, I flew over to see David and the band play the jam-packed Whelan's last year and then again for the Olympia this year. It was amazing to be part of the crowd. I mean, it's great. It's great to having all these people kind of commenting in and 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 connecting with you. And uh, I, I'd say, you know, that's amazing for you. Does you know? Does that give you like, um, you know, a, a certain drive to get to get back out there and 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 gig again when possible? I mean, that yeah, that drive is always going to be there because it's and like I said, it's like getting into the ring if you're a boxer. You just yeah. You, the fight's the fight is in me, you know. I'm not talking about always warring with myself, but there's nothing like it. There's nothing like playing in a room with people when there is no script. The songs can act as a kind of reminder of what's coming next, but anything can happen. And you have to deal with it. Somebody could shout out something. It's like stand-up comedy. Somebody could shout a, a heckle, and you you just react. You're in a flow state. <laughs> yeah, I noticed that. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I, I, I can meditate and run as much as I like, but nothing comes close to playing live. So I and noticed this, that when you were playing, like in the doc. Sorry to interrupt you. When you were playing in the in the documentary in the Olympia gig, it was just it's almost like you were kind of bulletproof, just because you know people would um, sing the lyrics and kind of like you know shout out bits, but it was all part of the show, like and it was all part of the um, it was all part of it for you. Yeah, well, people, you know, just I think in that gig. People just felt like they were at home. You know, we'd all reach this gig together, and you know, I'm not someone that demands everybody, you know, sit on sit on their hands and and you know, don't 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 shout up at me because I'm the artiste. Do you know what I mean? It's yeah, not about, yeah, yeah. It's 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 just it's an inclusive thing. You know what I mean? It's an inclusive thing. A gig and um. The audience, the audience is obviously has cultivated itself as well as me putting out music. But people come to the gig seem to be seem to be just open to taking part in it within reason. Do you know what I mean? And there's there's respect, there's there's, there's mutual respect, and I'm very grateful that people people support me because they're they're patrons. If somebody buys a record, it means that there's a, there's a demand, you know, for an, another record. And although I'd be releasing music if there wasn't anybody listening, because I have to do it to stay well. Um, you know, people that support me allow me to live a certain quality of life. Do you know what I mean? That's a fact. So I'm I'm incredibly grateful. And you just gotta try your best to keep being honest in your work and yourself, you know. So that's amazing. So um we chatted earlier just about the um the tribe and the uh the unholy ghosts and you know these the kind of mentors and, and uh big acts that you've worked with. Is there anyone is there anyone who you haven't worked with or haven't connected with that you still have, you know, you'd like to, or is on your kind of radar, or is on your kind of horizon? Uh, it's funny. There's a Scottish author called David Keenan, and uh, we've had la we've had laughs together, kind of online over the last few years because my photograph is up on Google, and I'm 49 years of old, years old, I'm 49 from Glasgow, or whatever. <laughs> There's been mix-ups. Well, we became, we've actually become friends. David Bell put us together at All Together Now last year. Oh, right. And uh, David's going to be involved in, in, in just something on my new record. Uh, he's just released a new book, X to Beth. It's brilliant. Uh, I'd love to I'd love to work with Warren Ellis from The Dirty Tree and this Nick Cave and the Bad Seas. And uh, I mean, the producer that I'm working with at the minute, Jonathan Mooney from Other Lives, he's, this record that we're making, it's, a, it's, it's an exploration. It's, it's, it's everything, you know, like it's definitely an evolution from what I've done, which is what I want to do in the work. But we're getting weird with it, and, and so it's very freeing. So mm. I'm happy, and of course, like the likes of Garrick and Redmond and the band, and 
you know, sometimes I look at my phone, you know, and I'm looking at people who've texted me and I'm like, fucking hell, you know, there's just scared heads in my life. It's like... Mm. If you could show that to your 15-year-old self now, it'd be kind of... Well, listen, I'll, I'll give you, I'll tell you, I'll give something away. So uh, one of the members of the Laz is actually playing a bit of guitar on a song on the new album. And no I was way. out... The, you know, I was I spoke to him and I and I was I had a, had a smoke and I was fuck if the eighteen year old me could see me now, you know, but he can see me and I can see him and it's like, you know, it's it's a beautiful serendipitous thing. But again, this is what music has brought to my life, you know. It's like, I was in I was on I was on the dole. I was um, you know I was miserable not to do something wrong, but I was in a in a really difficult place. Like I, I couldn't get my music. Uh, you know, I was standing in my own way for mm. so many. A couple of year, years and I was miserable and, and it saved me. It saved music has saved my life, you know. And um, I think people have been great in highlighting the the importance of supporting their local artists. You know, this this shop local concept has been put to people just buying a record direct from musicians or buying a T-shirt from a local venue because yeah. big those big online streamers don't give really directly anything to a musician unless you're in the one percent so yeah yeah I mean, yeah if i you know I, I can't have to be an advocate for that as well because everybody's struggling but can pick people picture their lockdown experience if you took art away if you took cinema away if you took mm. music away, it would be miserable so it needs to be nurtured in order mm. for it to flourish again and also yeah yeah we we, we kind of need to think about um artists artists young artists who are coming out um now you know what the knock-on effect for them is going to be um because basically we're being told that art is not a feasible feasible way to to make a living at the moment and you know imagine, imagine saying that to you know imagine saying that to Seamus Heaney or imagine saying that to uh to Mozart imagine saying that to, to to a young John Lennon listen pal you know forget about it you know what I mean you need to re-skill yeah. you know think yeah. about think about the world will be denied of, of so much fucking art and and education and joy joy you know and hope this is what this documentary gives me when i watch it it's it's hope it's hope of what can what can be achieved uh within me and the people that i know and the people mm. that come to things and it's hope that it's going to be there again and and it's also like yeah well, we're willing to fight for it as well absolutely yeah that's that's yeah that's a big big takeaway message i think for that is just you know that that hope for for art for the future as well um so you you mentioned earlier just about um we're gonna not not yet but soon enough we're gonna wrap up with a bit of music um but you you wrote a song especially dedicated to uh to gar and um do you want to tell me a little bit about about the tune or uh look it's 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 just a, it's just a i mean I could just I, I couldn't sit down and I haven't got it in me. I haven't got the tools to to condense what Gar meant to me or means to me in three minutes and you know better I don't know, I just haven't got that capacity. But mm. like I said earlier, the first thing that I do when I when I'm going through anything, be it uh, a great loss or a great joy, it's to it's to try to put it down in a song. Um mm. Gar, uh, Gar was was a real uh, rock and a hero for us. I I, I call it, we we called him the Rock of Gibraltar because he was he was so solid, um, and he was just an amazing wit and intelligence. You know, East Wall, Dublin, incredible storyteller. You know, he'd be, always be there for you. Uh, you know, at the drop of a hat, and he'd go to war for you. You know, and uh, we miss him dearly, and uh, I feel blessed to have known him. Um, mm. But the song is just the song is that, and I, I think as well, I just like to highlight once again, if anybody's struggling, you know, to, and or if anybody perceives their friends, pick up the phone, just pick up the phone, try to get to them, and uh, you know, we all have to kind of stay tight to the light, as Stephen Murphy says, and cultivate hope because it's it's the first point to call. Cultivate yeah. that positive energy, you know. So, yeah. And as as another member of your your tribe says in the in the documentary, is you know, music is about music is about friendship. Yeah. yeah, and the and the people that it 
gives you, the relationships that it gives you. You know, it's given me so much. All those people in the film, you know, it is, it's inquantifiable. And because you become informed by people around you, you are what you eat, you are what you consume, you are who your company is. And, you know, mm. I, I, I cherish all those, all those beautiful heads. So um, I want to thank them all, you know, and, and also Collective for, for having a will to make this thing and to, to, to edit this thing together and to create this thing. And to Rob Benson for always being there and the wings with his camera and taking photographs and documenting us. And uh, yeah, it's a beautiful thing to be involved in. I'm very grateful. And thanks to Doc and Roll Fest for picking it up and, and giving it a chance to, to reach a few more people as well. So. Brilliant. So listen, why don't I give you a few minutes there to get your get your guitar and get yourself ready, and um, I just uh, I'll, I'll speak to the audience and tell them. Thank you as well, brother. Thank you for your time too. Man. Thank you, thank you, and thanks to Doc and Roll Festival for having me uh, host this. Uh, it's it's been an absolute pleasure. So if anyone um, hasn't seen the documentary yet, please make your way over to docandrollfestival.com and it's uh, Alchemy and Prose is available to watch until Sunday, this Sunday, the 22nd of November. So on behalf of the London Irish Centre, thank you very much, David, for having us and, and for, for chatting mm -hmm. to me tonight. It's been, it's been a real pleasure. So uh, take it away. Thank you, brother. We'll do it again. Do it Hope again so. in real time. <laughs> any time, any time. <laughs> These walls, son, what have you seen since the music's been gone? I have been down the well and back again. Won't you give me a digger, my friend? Where have you been? These walls, son. Did you see through the facts we are choosing to shun? Though it cuts us right down in the core. No, we love you now all the more. His name was Garky. East wall, son, is your energy here for the laughter song? Please remind us at the onset of pain, your example will help to sustain lies of the tribe. His name was Garke. His name was Garkin. Memories are made. On and off the stage. But your voice never faltered. Yourselves of confusion and blame. Remember with a smile, his name was Gark. His name was Gark. His name was Gark. Thank you.